So I've been wanting to address this topic for a long time, but I couldn't find a gimmick or uh, an excuse or uh, some sort of a, a hook that would compel people to want to pay attention to this topic. And thankfully, that reason came uh, as Catholic Twitter came to the rescue. Um, as some controversy erupted on Catholic Twitter that got people talking about this, I can now say, well, this is a trending topic, so, so let's talk about it. Now, before I continue with my comments on this particular topic, I wanted to say a quick thank you to one of the sponsors of my channel, which is The Saint Maker. Now, what I like about this product, I've got one right here, I don't know if you can see that very well, is that it's it's really quite beautiful and well designed. So it's a joy to use, to handle, and to look through, but it's also incredibly useful. Um, I'm the kind of person who will just charge headlong into my day without coming up with any kind of plan to optimize um, the effectiveness of my efforts. And often the whole thing will just unravel as I watch helplessly. So what something like this planner and specifically this planner does is it helps you organize and prioritize your efforts so that you can come up with a system of habit that can grow into disciplines and maybe even virtues. But more than that, it, it heavily incorporates our faith into this. So it has has challenges for you to grow in your faith and holiness and prayer, but it also includes a calendar which which includes both the uh, the old uh, form and the new form of the Mass and the sanctoral cycle, so special days that we may want to commemorate. And this is huge for me because I'm the kind of person who, again, I'm not good at planning ahead. So what I'll often do is I will open up my breviary in the morning to, to do my morning prayers and discover, oh, today is the feast of so-and-so. That's an important saint for me. And I would have liked to have commemorated this and celebrated this day with my family. But because I wasn't prepared, I didn't plan ahead. Now it's just something that we can talk about really quickly, but then get on with our day. And then the day is kind of lost. So what this does is it helps you plan ahead so that you can acknowledge that those days are coming up and then come up with a plan to celebrate those days in a more significant way. So what's cool about it is that it helps us to seek first the kingdom of God and then to go about planning and prioritizing our efforts for the rest of the day to achieve our goals, never apart from keeping in mind the highest priority, which is our relationship with God. It's published four times a year. Its features include daily planning pages, feast days and devotions for both forms of the liturgical calendar, like I've mentioned, goal setting pages, confession journals, which is kind of a cool feature. And if you don't like it, you can send it back within 90 days for a full refund. So if you're interested and you want to check it out, you can go to thesaintmaker.com. I'm told quantities are limited. So if you want to get yours reserved for the coming months, then go to thesaintmaker.com and get yours. So it all started when the Bishop of Venice, Florida sent out a letter to the priests of his diocese, which then somehow got leaked onto social media, in which he explained that as he understood, some of his priests were celebrating the Mass in what's called Ad Orientum, which means facing the East, but is often understood to simply mean facing the same direction as the congregation, with his back to the congregation, um, in which he, he said that he didn't want to he, he wasn't going to allow that anymore and he requested that every all of his priests celebrate instead versus populum which means facing the congregation now if you aren't familiar with these concepts they are part of the larger liturgical debate that has persisted since the reforms of the 1960s and 70s prior to that mass was always celebrated with the priest facing the altar which was usually fixed to the wall the back wall of the sanctuary so he would have his back to the congregation for certain portions of the mass after the new missile was promulgated it included this line about uh, building the altars away from that back wall so that the priest could walk around it and when it was translated into english that english translation suggested that not only was it preferable for the the altar to be built away from the wall but also that the priest face the congregation now some have said that that's a, a mistranslation and that there are even indications within the missal that say that when the priest turns his, turns back towards the congregation that is an indication that of course he should be he should be celebrating at orientum and also um pope benedict when he was cardinal Joseph Ratzinger wrote a book called The Spirit of the Liturgy, in which he also advocates at that point that we should be celebrating ad orientum. So as a growing appreciation for the more traditional liturgical practices is growing, especially among younger Catholics, 
Um, those who feel that the the newer practices that they consider to be reforms of the council, um, even though the council never said that we should be doing these kinds of things, <clears throat> they've grown a bit more aggressive in their refusals to allow this kind of thing to, to go on. And that seems to be the perception of what this letter from this particular bishop is about. And to add insult to injury, unfortunately, the bishop misspelled the word orientum several times, I think, um, in the phrase ad orientum, which his critics seized upon as an indication that he doesn't even have a, a, a fundamental grasp of the subject matter that he's trying to impose restrictions on. But to add insult to insult to injury, now because every mass is streamed online, if you want to take an inventory of how um, strictly the liturgical practices of a particular diocese observed or are observed, you can just look at the uh, at all the parishes that are celebrating it online. And so a video of a priest in this diocese emerged in which he was guilty of committing a, a range of liturgical abuses. Um, presumably with the complacency of his bishop intact, even though that the letter of this same bishop insisted that the reason we are cracking down on ad orientum is because the liturgical norms need to be followed. One example of liturgical abuse that everybody was pinpointing in this particular video was that the priest had replaced the confidior, which is a prayer in the penitential act, um, with some sort of a yogic breathing exercise in which we we exhale all of our burdens and our stresses and the things that are bothering us which really misses the point of the penitential act within the in the mass um, and therefore this is a really critical um, and egregious liturgical abuse in my estimation because the whole point of the penitential act is not for us to relieve ourselves of things that are bothering us from the outside, but to relieve us of things that we have committed ourselves through our own grievous fault, that is our sins, to be forgiven of those and therefore be reconciled to God and ready to now participate in the sacrifice of the mass fully without this, this kind of wedge between us and God. But instead, this priest introduced this sort of silly alternative, which has nothing to do with the intention of what's supposed to be happening at the Mass in that prayer. And what I find additionally disturbing about this kind of phenomenon within the church is that it's an example of a particular priest or worship leader or what have you who has decided that the common prayer of the whole church, that is that collective who has decided together prayerfully, um, magisterially that a particular approach to the liturgy is preferable or, or best. And they even said, said, no, my particular personal preference is what should be done here. And that's, that should be obvious why that's a problem. So while the offenses of that streamed mass aren't the focus of this video, I did want to take a moment to talk about it a little bit since we're on the topic. Um, the first is that when it started to draw attention from the social media warriors, it predicted it predictably received a lot of backlash uh, from people disliking the video and contributing comments like this is so cringe and this is a disgrace and this is an insult to our Lord, etc. And while that may be true, I couldn't help but be left with this nagging feeling or this nagging question of what does that accomplish? And don't get me wrong, I sympathize uh, with those sentiments, but just because I have those feelings on the inside doesn't mean I have to release them on the outside. And this whole internet mob mentality is responsible for some pretty heinous behavior that I can think of uh, some episodes in recent memory, which is why I'm so disappointed when I see supposedly Orthodox Catholics doing the exact same thing. Like, I really don't think any of the people who are worthy of criticism in videos like this are going to hear angry comments from anonymous trads like that and think to themselves, oh, you're right. We need to, we need to better conform our celebration of the liturgy to the instruction and the traditions of the church. If anything, it's going to have the opposite effect. If anything, it's going to leave them with a really negative impression and association with Orthodox Catholicism and the community that tends to orbit around it. It's going to convince them that they're the good guys, they're the victims, because the good guys wouldn't act the way that the people who are commenting on this video are. 
Um, I think I can say that with a certain measure of confidence because I think that's how I would react if I was on the receiving end of that kind of condemnation. And I know some people will hear that and they'll say, well, what's the alternative then? Uh, just to say nothing? Because that's, that's just cowardice. Um, an abuse of the church's liturgy is something that needs to be called out. And I agree, that's, that's absolutely true. Um, but admonishing the sinner isn't merely finger wagging or, um, or preaching condemnation on somebody. It should be something like an invitation to make adjustments and to realign yourself with the church. And that as a prerequisite means that however it is that you're going to um, to go about admonishing the sinner or, or offering that invitation, it needs to be as effective as possible. It can't just be some sort of cathartic release of your own where you are expressing all your anger and frustration on people who aren't getting it exactly right. It needs to be something that is um, more strategically offered and more likely to, in, to get them to respond to that invitation in a positive way. So in that spirit, I would start by giving these people the benefit of the doubt. And I say these people because it wasn't just the priest doing this. He had a whole musical ensemble who seemed to be fully invested in this understanding of the liturgy and this flavor of Catholicism. If they're wrong about the way that they're conducting liturgy, and I'd say there's a lot to suggest they are, it may not be because they are maliciously trying to undermine the church's liturgy or her vitality. It could be that they think, they think this is what renewal looks like this is what will make the church attractive to those who are uncomfortable with religion. And the reason I think that this is a viable explanation is because it was true for me at one point, uh, which is why I'm not so quick to condemn people, uh, or at least the intent of people like this, because I'm guilty of the exact same sin. I used to lead praise and worship style guitar at mass every Sunday for years, and I know every time someone came up and made a snide remark or, or maybe even lectured us a little bit about what we were doing and, and that it was wrong, um, it only ever made us feel more convicted that we were right in what we were doing. What would have been helpful is if they came up and invited us to learn more about what the church actually teaches about the liturgy. Because the thing about, at least speaking for myself, is that I've always considered myself for as long as I've been Catholic to be someone who is a faithful and orthodox Catholic insofar as I understood what that meant. But in my early faith, I didn't know any better. I thought this is this is what I had taught uh, the liturgy looks like. And so I just enthusiastically participated in it and then came to be a leader in it. I used to think that the best way to draw people into the faith was by making um, it as trendy and contemporary as possible, especially in its liturgical expression. And what I've come to realize since then is that except in really rare cases, this approach in the balance of things typically has the opposite effect. And if you think about it, it isn't hard to understand why. The most obvious criticism I could make about it is that it excludes large portions of faithful Catholics. And that's because popular contemporary culture isn't real culture, it's consumerist culture. When we think of culture, all of the, the fixtures that we associate with that, things like food and language and music and art, are actually just byproducts of what happens when people are bound together by something radically communal, which is often cultic worship. And cultic here isn't being used in the sense that we normally use as some sort of something negative, but the ancient practice of worshiping something greater than ourselves, usually something of a divine nature. That's why the word cult appears in the word culture. But in popular contemporary culture, those kinds of byproducts are just packaged together for their marketability and then consumed individualistically. It's antithetical to what true authentic culture is and it doesn't bring people together it separates them based on their own unique identity and the products that they happen to prefer and consume it's it's fundamentally individualistic that doesn't create inclusivity except by accident so when we draw inspiration from pop consumer culture the in the way that we worship as a community it's always going to exclude someone or a group of someone's who don't find whatever pop culture influence we're using attractive. Even if we try to pick the most popular music imaginable that will be accepted by the most number of people and the most popular personal style of communication, there will always be some portion of people who are repelled by that and as a result think that what they're rejecting as they reject that is the Catholic faith itself when in fact it's just one particular attempt at shoehorning some trend or some preference into the Catholic faith. 
They're rejecting a current of fashion and mistaking it for the actual faith. If someone's going to reject the Catholic faith, it's important that they reject it for what it actually is because their rejection is their responsibility. They're culpable for that before God. But if they reject the faith because I substituted Gregorian chant for 80s style power ballads because I happen to like those and they don't and they reject it as a result, then it's I who am culpable for that rejection. And that's a scary thought. And for us Catholics, the one thing that we have in common and the one thing that draws us all together in community and in worship is the Catholic faith as it has been preserved and handed down from generation to generation, tracing itself all the way back to Christ himself. That's the thing that provides inclusivity because it's what draws us from all people from all diverse backgrounds and even ethnic persuasions and personal sensibilities. We are all drawn together by that one thing. But when that is substituted for some personal preference of the priest or the, the music leaders, then you will inevitably and unjustly exclude people from their own faith. If we do that, we will compromise the only thing that we can say we are all here to partake in and turn it into something that only a portion of the people are here to partake in. So the very last thing that we can say if we do something like that is that it's being done in the name of inclusivity or to make the Catholic faith more accessible. But let me try to redirect us now to um, part of the focal point of this conversation that I wanted to spend some time on, which is this question of ad orientum worship or the direction that the priest should face during the sacrifice of the mass. Somewhat recently, I saw a televised discussion or maybe even a debate, if you want to think of it, um, that took place between a Catholic priest and a layman who was a convert to the Catholic faith, but who was very very knowledgeable about the faith and even wrote about it um, that took place in the wake of the reforms uh, in the 1970s. And the topic of the direction and the posture of the priest, whether it's ad orientum or versus populum, um, inevitably came up. And the priest explained that the reformers meant for the priest to face the congregation to promote and encourage active participation. Now let me pause and comment on that for a second, because if you've never been to a traditional uh, Catholic liturgy, the Trinitine Mass or the traditional Latin Mass, depending on how you refer to it, you might be under the impression that the priest, if you've only ever heard it described from um, people who are enthusiastic about the reforms or the reformers themselves, you might be under the, under the impression that the priest spends the entire time with his back to the congregation out of a kind of disregard for the people or even a disrespect for the people. But that's actually not true at all. The priest does face the congregation at certain points throughout the Mass, but he does so with a purpose and a reason. For example, he does it when he is addressing the congregation, like inviting them to uh, a prayer or to a particular response. Um, he, he will turn to the congregation at that point. At other points, like, like the homily or when he's reading uh, from, from scripture, um, he faces the congregation for an extended period of time. The reason for this diversity in posture is in part to help us understand where our attention to, should be focused, but also because he is directing his attention at who it is that he is addressing. When he's speaking to the people, he faces the people. When he is speaking to God, uh, when he's addressing God, he directs our attention away from himself and towards God by turning to the altar. And that's just an intuitive way to communicate with somebody, right? We don't just speak with our words, we communicate with our entire bodies. Uh, imagine trying to have a conversation with somebody who never faces you or never looks you in the eye or maybe even turns their back to you. You probably feel disrespected. We become so obsessed with the apparent disrespect paid towards us by the priest having his back to us that we never consider the disrespect he might pay towards God by having his back to God when he's supposed to be addressing God. And what's more important, that the priests honor us or honor God? Let me try to use an analogy that I hope will be effective. Imagine like a large boat that is kind of like one of those ancient Viking rowboats or something like that. And forgive me, I don't know a lot of the language around this. And let's say it's got a crew of people who are all basically doing the same thing and then a leader, something like a captain or a crew leader or something like that. And they're all trying to get to, to their destination. They're all trying to collaborate in that effort. What would make more sense and encourage cooperative participation? If they all faced each other in sort of a communal thing, um, or if they all faced their intended destination as they're rowing. Now, there could obviously be moments in which the leader or the crew captain or whatever we want to call him has to face the rest of the crew and give them some encouragement or some instruction. But when they're all trying to work together and participating in that effort together, 
they would return to facing in the same direction. That's how you know they're synchronizing their efforts together. I would say that something like that is going on in the old liturgy. In the new, with everyone facing the priest and vice versa, the entire time, you might be able to claim that this increases active participation, but I would claim that what they are participating in isn't what they are supposed to be participating in. They're participating in a dialogue between each other when they should all be focusing their intention on their intended, which is God, which is the sacrifice of the altar, which is the object of their prayer and worship. Instead, they're interacting with each other albeit in a very participatory way, we've got a lot of participation going on, but they're not doing the work that they're supposed to be doing, or they're easily distracted from that because of these misdirected cues. We're participating in something much more like a performance than unified worship. And after having participated, and I use that word very deliberately, in liturgies celebrated at Orientum, let me just say that it's a beautiful thing uh, to be synchronized in posture, both priest and congregation, all praying not to each other, uh, not as like um, a performer and the audience, but all as a group doing something together, um, fate oriented towards the reason why we are there to encounter the living God through his incarnate son. Thanks for watching. The reason I can continue making content like this is because of the generous support of my viewers. If you feel called to support this work, then consider joining the Reinforcements, which is my online community. There are multiple tiers, including free access for those who can't help financially, but still want to join. You can join up at www.brianholtworth.ca. Certain levels will also get a free gift basket from Glory and Shine, who is a family-owned Catholic bath and body products company, whose beard balm I'm wearing right now. It's like aromatherapy for your face. Even if you don't join, they make amazing products. So check them out at gloryandshine.com. And don't forget to like and subscribe. You don't have to agree with everything I said to get value out of these kinds of conversations. So be sure to subscribe to be edified or challenged. There's value in both.